Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone. And if you're a fan of our show, you'll know that we have a special series called Gone But Not Forgotten, in which we celebrate and honor the work and legacies of Hollywood's greatest stars. Today, I'm delighted to welcome the son of a three-time Academy Award-nominated actress who starred in some of the most memorable movies of all time, including Caged, Detective Story, Interrupted Melody, Scaramouche, Above and Beyond, The Man with the Golden Arm, and everybody's favorite, The Sound of Music. She was also nominated for a Golden Globe, an Emmy, three Laurel Awards, and she won Best Actress at the Venice Film Festival in 1950. Of course, I'm talking about the radiant and brilliantly gifted Eleanor Parker. I'm delighted to welcome her dear son, Paul Clemens, to our show. And if he looks familiar, that's because he's also a very talented award-winning actor who you've seen in movies such as The Passage, The Beast Within, Communion, and The Sound of Spying. He's also guest starred on many TV shows, including Quincy, Murder, She Wrote, The Ray Bradbury Theatre, and many others. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Paul, I think the first question that everybody wants me to ask is, what's it like to grow up being the child of a famous movie star? Wow. Well, that's the million dollar question. (laughs) Well, I mean, it both was different what most people would consider different and surprisingly in some areas, not that different because my mother was a very private person. She assiduously avoided mixing her professional life with her home life. It was very important to her to have as normal a home life as possible for her kids. Occasionally the two would mesh and intrude. I went to schools with enough other kids who were in the industry that they didn't consider it strange. One of my friends was the son of Yvonne DiCarlo, uh, the Munsters, also John Astin's kids. I went to school with them at a different school, and John Astin later became a a mentor to me and wound up starring in a play that I wrote about Edgar Allan Poe called Edgar Allan Poe, Once Upon a Midnight. But you go to school with the kids like that, and in schools where there are a lot of other kids who are the children of entertainment figures, and they don't make a big deal about it because it's, you know, in that kind of a venue, for instance, Beverly High is where I graduated in 1976. There were so many kids there whose families were in the entertainment industry. It really was just not a big deal. So if I'd gone to another kind of school, who knows? In fact, (laughs) I did one year go to a boarding school in New Hampshire, and it wasn't so ordinary there. And when they found out who my mom was, what my background was, where my family lived. It was unfortunate for a little while that they found that out because I was teased mercilessly about that. But eventually, once they you know, gave me their own personal seal of approval as a person, and I was an okay guy, then they, they let all that go. So other than stuff like that, you know, my growing up was, was a bit pretty normal. I should point out that your father, who was also named Paul Clemens, was a very famous artist whose paintings and lithographs first focused on sports, and then he became best known for his portraits of movie stars. He was frequently referred to by art critics as the American Renoir. You must be so proud of both of your parents, Paul. Oh, yeah, enormously. Yeah, my dad, he painted, you know, a wide variety of landscapes, paintings of ballet, which so some of his paintings are reminiscent of Degas. He painted everything, all kinds of things, but he became known for his portraits and became sort of the, the painter to the stars. And he painted everybody. Most famously in later years, he painted the official portrait of Frank Sinatra. He was commissioned by Sinatra to do this. And it was, it was Sinatra's favorite painting of himself. He felt it was the only painting that had ever been done of him that showed him as a private person, the real inner him, not, not the public persona. And that painting was uh, displayed uh, next to his uh, casket at his funeral on an easel and was also the first and last image that Chuck Workman used in his Academy montage film that he did as a tribute to Sinatra after his passing. And the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I want people to see this photo of you with life-size busts that you sculpted of Peter Lorre, Charles Lawton's Quasimodo, Lon Chaney Jr.'s Wolfman, Lon Chaney Sr.'s London After Midnight, and Boris Karloff's Mummy. 
you're quite the artist yourself, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've done professional special effects, makeup, sculpting. Makeup was a hobby for years and along with acting. And at one point, uh, I was toying with the idea of maybe become, before I went into acting professionally, I was toying with the idea of maybe becoming a professional makeup artist. But the acting inclination, the acting bug bit me too hard and the inclination was just too strong to not go there. But I did a lot of uh, drawing, painting, and sculpting. And that clearly was inherited from my dad. Now, your parents divorced in 1965 when you were only seven years old. That must have been a difficult time for you. Not as much as you might think because of the way my parents handled it. There was no visible upset that the kids were aware of. There were no screaming rows or anything like that. Uh, No, I, I don't really have memories of trauma associated with that. You know, there were times where my mom or my dad would be away, you know, on a, working on a project or doing something. My dad spent a certain amount of time in his studio, which used to be in our home. And then he got his own very much larger studio. But I saw my dad plenty and my parents, you know, never used me as a football or anything between them. So there wasn't any kind of pressure either way. And they remained very friendly and cordial with each other. So it worked out as well as that kind of thing can. Now, looking at your mother's early beginnings in Hollywood, there she was doing everything she could to work on her craft of being an actress, appearing in plays, but she ended up getting a screen test, not from being seen on the stage, but by being spotted in the audience at the Pasadena Playhouse by a Warner Brothers talent scout. That's the stuff that Hollywood dreams are made of, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. It sounds made up, but it's actually true. In 1946, your mom was chosen to star in the remake of the 1934 film of Human Bondage starring Betty Davis. Can you imagine how intimidating that must have been for her and how much guts she had to take on that role? She was pretty focused all the time on, you know, what she needed to do. I don't think she spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what had been done before or, and and she was a friend of Betty's anyway. So, you know, there, she would have had her well wishes, I'm sure. And she just concentrated on the task at hand, which for her was making the character as believable and authentic as possible. And in some senses, maybe more unlikable than, than Betty had been. But my mom was very concerned about wanting to, for example, to get the accent right. And she took great care with the Cockney dialect and so forth. And she, she, even though she loved working with Paul Henry, she worked with him twice in Between Two Worlds. When she worked with Paul Henry on that, it was fine. I mean, she didn't have a problem with him on uh, Human Bondage either. She just felt that he was slightly miscast. The character is supposed to be British. She felt the ideal casting was the original casting opposite Betty Davis. Yeah, my, my mom had felt that Leslie Howard was the ideal casting for, for that role, the, the role opposite her in A Human Bondage. And Paul Henry, even though he's a fine actor, he was, I believe, German. It was a different, you know, different kind of ambiance mood there from him. So the main thing to her was that she be authentic. And that's where all of her concentration went from beginning to end was uh, that she really didn't uh, bother herself with, you know, precedence, things that had come before or after for that matter. Now, Eleanor Parker said publicly that the role of Mildred in Of Human Bondage was her favorite role. Um, Not true. Not true. Uh, It may have been at the time, you know, shortly after she had done it. That sounds right. I have read that. But her favorite role far and away of all time was the role of Marjorie Lawrence in the film Interrupted Melody. And that was her, not the only her favorite role, that was her favorite film of all the films that she had done. That was her personal favorite. The director of the film of Human Bondage, Edmund Golding, said that Eleanor Parker was one of the five greatest actresses in America. Now that's really something, isn't it? Yes, yes, it certainly is. Now I referred to your mom a few minutes ago as being gutsy. Well, here's more proof. She turned down a number of movie roles because she didn't think they were right for her. And she got suspended three times by Warner Brothers. Other than Betty Davis and Olivia de Havilland, no other actress had the guts to do that in those days. That's just remarkable. She did that all the time. She really, 
was willing to sacrifice the pay that she would be docked and, you know, so forth. Nothing was more important to her than being, you know, feeling she was playing the right roles for herself at the time. And so she was willing to say thanks, but no thanks in those instances. She would joke about it, but it certainly wasn't a joking matter at the time. Your mom co-starred with the most famous actors of all time, including Clark Gable, John Garfield, Errol Flynn, Humphrey Bogart, Kirk Douglas, Robert Mitchum, Frank Sinatra, so many more. Did she have a favorite leading man? Well, one of them was certainly Robert Taylor, who she worked with three times. And they had a real chemistry in real life as well. And I think they kind of came close to, you know, getting hitched, maybe. I mean, it was it was no accident that they worked together three times. They really, really enjoyed each other's company and had a really great chemistry together. And the three films they did together were all very different. One was an action adventure, widescreen epic in uh, Egypt, Valley of the Kings. And another was a wild slapstick frontier comedy, Many Rivers to Cross. And then talk about a change of pace, the story of the dropping of the atom bomb on Hiroshima where she played the wife of Colonel Paul Tibbetts, the man who headed the, the mission. And in all three of those cases, she had a wonderful time working with Robert Taylor. In fact, the only one of her leading men that she had a problem with, and I don't mind saying this now, he's long since deceased, but Stuart Granger. Oh, she in, starred with him in Scaramouche. In Scaramouche. He was a piece of work, as they say and was really the only one of her leading men who I remember her vividly saying not pleasant things about. He was very egocentric, very persnickety. During the very famous sword fight scene, one of the great sword fights in cinema history towards the end of the film, he dropped his sword at one point and Mel Ferrer, who he was fighting with in real life, was an expert swordsman. Granger was not. And he would fumble things and at one point when he dropped his sword, he got so angry that he picked up his sword and he threw it point first at the camera crew. It could have taken someone's eye out or seriously injured someone. Luckily, it didn't. But at that point, somebody told him, you better watch out. You don't get a light dropped on you because that did not endear him to the crew, needless to say. And then I've heard other stories since then about other movies from people that I've worked with who worked with Granger and had similar kinds of stories to tell. The man was not a sweetheart. And your mother was such a professional. She would really have not appreciated that kind of temperamental childishness. She had no room for that. No, no tolerance for that. No. Unfortunately, she didn't have to deal with that very often. So did she have a favorite director? Gosh, favorite director. Yeah. You know, I, I think she did for different reasons. And that was uh, Delmer Daves. Not quite as much because of his directorial skill, although he was very skillful, but she had an emotional bond with him that was very strong. And in fact, I think something would have wound up happening between the two of them, except for the fact that Daves was, was married. So nothing came of it, except they both had this strong thing that, that lasted. They had a real emotional bond. And she used to kind of tear up when she would uh, remember him and think about him. So, you know, I'd have to say in that regard, emotionally speaking, he was probably her favorite for, you know, those reasons. But she loved working with, you know, Robert Wise in The Sound of Music. Oh, she didn't love working with Vincenti Minnelli. He, he made her very nervous. And when they were doing the Robert Mitchum film, Home from the Hill, she, she thought he was an excellent director. Technically, or th that wasn't her issue. But as a person, he could be very, I don't know, he just, he made her nervous. He would keep making her feel very tense. And it got so bad at one point that she almost fainted. She had to, she had to lie down. She got dizzy and they, she, she made it sound like she al like almost passed out, I guess. But, you know, they, that was a rarity. Uh, usually she was fine with whoever, but he apparently could get very strident and it just had a demeanor that at certain points made her feel very tense. I want to ask you about Caged, which your mom made in 1950. She got her first Oscar nomination for Best Actress, and she won the Best Actress Award at the Venice Film Festival. That was a very powerful film about a woman in prison, and your mom was magnificent in that role. Is it true that she had to lobby really hard to get that role? 
Yeah, yeah, she did. I, I don't know all of the uh, details of that, although I did read about it somewhat recently in some research I was doing. But yeah, what you say is, is in fact, absolutely true. She did uh, lobby hard to get back because she knew it was really right for her. She knew what she could do with it. And interestingly, I have a wonderful letter from Ellen Burstyn, three-page letter, just beautiful. It, it's been published recently in a terrific book called Letters from Hollywood, published by Abrams, the, the, the art house press, a beautifully produced book. And I'm pleased uh, to tell you that we did a show with the two editors of Letters from Hollywood, and I'm so grateful to you for mentioning it. Oh, wow. Okay. So Rocky? Rocky, Rocky Lang, Lang and, and Barbara Hall. Rocky is an old friend. I've known him for years. He's a, just a, a great, super talented, multi-talented guy. Barbara Hall, lovely woman, an amazing scholar. She's just terrific. They were both marvelous to work with on that project. And I wound up doing uh, many appearances with them at various uh, bookstore signings and talks that they gave. About six or seven times they had me come along and had me read my letter from Ellen Burstyn to the, uh, to the you know, people assembled there. And Burstyn, in the letter, talked about what an influence on her acting career my mother was and her, her versatility and the fact that she learned from my mother, particularly mentioned Caged, as showing what an actress could accomplish in terms of a character arc an emotional arc during the course of, you know, a single film, what you could do. And she was, you know, really inspired by the work that my mom had done. You know, my mother was really two actresses in one, in a sense. She was the epitome of the glamour that people think of from that era, the golden age of Hollywood and all of that. And God knows she played some of those roles and certainly looked the part. But that's not where her heart lay as an actress. She wanted to become different people. And in many respects, she was she was kind of like a forerunner to Meryl Streep, really the, the first of, of, of that type, or one of the first, along with a couple other actresses like Betty Davis and so, so forth, who really had myriad facets and different faces. And to the degree that some people weren't even sure it was my mother. Sometimes when they'd see her in a film, she would look so different from part to part that, and, you know, really became the character, lost herself in the role in the right kind of way. And people were a bit thrown by that, which is why she certainly was a star, but she never became the sort of superstar that she could have done if she had been less in a sense of a character actress and more of the glamour type. And also she had herself to blame. It was, I mean, blame is really the wrong word because she you know, wouldn't have done anything differently if she had had a, a do-over. She was very private, did not like to do talk shows. She turned everyone down. She turned down Johnny Carson numerous times, Merv Griffin, you know, you name it. She turned them down and you know, if people go to archives and go looking for, you know, uh, television interviews with her, there it's slim pickings. Uh, she did. There's a couple things there. She did to Ed Sullivan, but he had to come to her. She didn't come to him. <laughs> he came to the when she was doing King and Four Queens with Clark Gable. He came to the set where they had the director's chair set up outdoors on the location. And the director was there too, Raoul Walsh. And of course, Clark Gable. And so they were all there talking with Sullivan. So my mother didn't feel quite so, you know, hemmed in. She was so shy that all three times when she came to the Oscars for her, you know, three nominated roles in uh, Caged and uh, Detective Story and Interrupted Melody, she went in the back way. She didn't want to do the red carpet. Though she was that private. It made her a nervous wreck. She would like, you know, cry before had she really did not want to be seen in that public a, a venue not that she never went out to dinner or went to parties or whatever she would but she'd lose herself in a group setting she didn't want the spotlight being on her as herself she so she problem. enjoyed being a working actress but she did not enjoy being a star that's right. When she, when she did the musical applause, the, the Lauren Bacall role, she did the national tour, uh, the National Company of Applause, which along with uh, Interrupted Melody and uh, two or three other performances, I put right up there among the very best work of hers that I ever saw. And I saw her do applause probably, I don't know, a, a few dozen times. 
and standing ovations every night. She was amazing. And that's a musical. And she sang beautifully and acted beautifully. It was a hell of a performance. In fact, the composers of the musical later said that they, they, they wished that my mom had created the role. Not that Bacall was bad in any way, but Bacall's persona was tougher. And it was a tougher rendition of the part. And they felt my mother brought more vulnerability uh, to the role of Margot Channing. So there she was, this shy woman, right, who, you know, would go in the back door at the Oscars playing for huge houses of a thousand and some odd people every night. And she had no problem doing that at all. Why? Because she was a character. She was, she was able to wear the mask of the character. She didn't feel she was up there as herself, which she wasn't, of course. So that's the kind of dichotomy that's sort of interesting. Here's a shy woman who didn't have a problem doing stage and appearing in front of audiences because she had the character to hide behind. Now, in 1950, Eleanor Parker left Warner Brothers after having been under contract there for eight years. She um, ended up signing a five-year contract with MGM. Was she happier there than she was at Warner's? I don't think she had to you know, turn down as many projects. <laughs> You know, for one thing, I don't think she felt as much pressure to do things that she didn't want to do. So that was probably, you know, a good part of it right there. I think a lot of the things she wound up turning down were while she was at Warner's. There may have been one or two with uh, MGM, but I don't recall that. I know it was for MGM that she did Interrupted Melody, which was a glorious experience for her. And that being her favorite film and her favorite role. Uh, you and know, that's your yeah. favorite of your mom's movies, too, isn't it? It is. It is. Your mind, too. Although in 1955, your mom played one of her most challenging roles as the wheelchair bound wife of the heroin addict played by Frank Sinatra in Man with the Golden Arm. Did she ever yeah. talk about what it was like to work with Frank Sinatra? Because he was well known for not wanting to rehearse. Not not at that time. He wasn't. That's the interesting thing. She really had two very different experiences working with Sinatra. Her first one, doing Man with the Golden Arm, was, was really good. And he worked hard at it, and he didn't mind however many takes needed to be done to get it right. And he, was, he took it really seriously and was very dedicated to it. But Frank, his personality over the years seemed to change a little bit. He lost a lot of the patience that he had back then or the, you know, or the, the focus that he had at that time for wanting to really dig in. So when she did A Hole in the Head, which she didn't have a bad experience doing, but at that point, it was years later, and Frank, by that point, really didn't like to rehearse much, didn't like to do a lot of takes. He wanted to get it, you know, sort of one and done and out of there. So for her, it was, she was a bit thrown by, you know, how different things were working with him then, as opposed to a Man with the Golden Arm. Your mom was hoping to produce a film called L'Eternel about French resistance fighters, but she didn't get to do it. Did, did you ever find out why? No, I never did. The thing that I knew about that she wanted to do was a later thing. And my stepfather, Raymond Hirsch, tried to obtain the rights to Belle de Jour, which eventually was made. It was done with the famous uh, beauty, Catherine Deneuve. And that is the role that my mother really wanted to do at that point uh, in time, which would have been the late 60s. It was just a matter of, you know, not being able to secure the rights. It had already been bought. And then it was, uh, it was made by uh, Louis Mal, the French director, and beautifully done, too. So it would have been, a, obviously, a very different film uh, with my mother. But nonetheless, that's the only role I can remember that she, you know, was really behind wanting to get produced and you know, as a vehicle for herself. I really only learned about the other one you mentioned, Le Tournel, uh, uh, much more recently. And my mother passed away in 2013. So sadly, I can't uh, ask her any details about that. Now, Paul, of course, no interview about Eleanor Parker would be complete without mentioning her role as the Baroness Elsa Schrader in the blockbuster film The Sound of Music. Do you think yes. she had any idea when she made that film that it would become such a timeless classic? None of them did. Christopher Plummer has said the same. No, they didn't have a clue. No, nobody does make him. You don't know, you know, when, when they made The Wizard of Oz, the cast of that film sure didn't know that it was going to become a timeless classic. And in fact, when famously, when The Wizard of Oz was first released, it wasn't a giant hit. 
The reviews were mixed. I mean, it became a beloved classic later because of being shown at holiday time on television. And then we all, you know, grew up with it. And, it, and then it was indeed beloved. But Sound and Music, though, unlike Wizard of Oz, was a huge hit when it came out, a massive success. But nobody really knows, even though a movie may be raking in millions of dollars, you don't really know how it will stand the test of time. You know, will it last? Well, you know, boy, it's lasted all right. Just uh, just go to the Hollywood Bowl once a year and <laughs> for the Sound of Music sing-along they do there. You know, it's, no, it's amazing. In fact, I was just contacted by some people in Austria, in Salzburg, who are in the middle of creating a museum all about the sound of music. They contacted me for my blessing legally uh, in terms of using materials to do with my mom. And, you know, I certainly gladly gave them my blessing. And they're, they're working with all the families and all the different, you know, business aspects of things to get that to happen. I mean, it's going to, I'm sure. Oh, that's fantastic. I would love to go with you to Austria to see that museum. <laughs> You got a date. I'd love to do it. I've never been to, to Austria. I'd sure love to go to Salzburg of, of all places in Austria for obvious reasons. I mean, it, it happens to be one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It is gorgeous. Breathtaking. Let's do it, Paul. Hey, sounds good. <laughs> the interesting thing about the sound of music, and this, this echoes the uh, an almost identical experience that uh, Christopher Plummer had with the film. For years, she kind of resented the Sound of Music. She had a, uh, what you, I guess, could call a love-hate relationship with that film because the film was so famous, so beloved, that that's all people half the time would want to talk about when my mother's name would come up and when they would talk to her and it's, you know, Sound of Music this and Sound of Music that. And she was kind of like, oh, you know, not that she felt she did badly in it. She, you know, she knew she was fine in the film. Robert Wise said lovely things over the years about her work in it. And that he didn't even have to direct her much. He cast her because he knew she she could take the curse off a role that could have become very unsympathetic. And he knew with her doing it, she wouldn't be unsympathetic, uh, which she wasn't. It was very she was ultimately very poignant in it. So she she was pleased with that, but she hadn't seen the film in years, you know, and uh, had sort of avoided. Would come on and she'd go, "Oh God, that you you know turn off TV or turn the channel, you know, I don't want to see that." Same thing with Christopher Plummer. Oh, he didn't want to see that. And then his, uh, his grandchildren one day forced him, cornered him, forced him to watch the film with them. Plummer sat down, gritted his teeth and watched the film. And then much to his growing surprise, he began to see, hey, th this, this actually, this is not too bad. In fact, this is pretty good. Did you ever this do that with your mom? Make her sit down and watch it? I didn't have to because one night when it was on and I wasn't there with her, that she just decided to watch it. And she had exactly the same experience that Plummer had. And she was like, as if it was, she hadn't seen it in so long, it was as if she was seeing it for the first time. And she was able to be much more objective. And she began to realize just what a really fine piece of work it was on all levels. And by the end of the film, she felt actually proud to, and, and really pleased to have done it. And she said, you know, she said this to me later, if, if, if I wind up being remembered primarily for the being in the sound of music, hey, there are worse things. Oh, my heavens. Things. Yes. Now, beginning uh, in 1960, your wait. mom started appearing on television at a time when many movie stars were resistant to going on TV because they thought it wasn't prestigious enough. But Eleanor <laughs> Parker loved acting. And she could yep. tell that there was a big future in television. And I so admire her for that. Yeah, yeah. She wasn't a, a snob, you know, when it came to any of that. She, she happily did TV. Although <laughs> that leads me to ask you this. Your mother yeah. got three Oscar nominations for Caged, Detective Story, and Interrupted Melody. She got three Laurel Award nominations for Top Female Star in 1958, 59, and 60. She got an Emmy nomination in 1963 for The Eleventh Hour. She got a Golden Globe nomination in 1970 for Bracken's World. And of course, in 1950, she won the Best Actress Award at the Venice Film Festival for Caged. But I always got the feeling that your mother was underappreciated within the industry for the great talent that she was. Do you think she ever felt that way? I don't think she cared. <laughs> to be really honest, I don't, I mean, that, that kind of recognition, 
it really didn't mean much to her. Plus, I mean, the, the floods of fan mail that she got were, you know, it was, that never stopped. Uh, so, uh, you know, certainly she was appreciated by the public. And as far as within the industry, you know, there were enough people over the years like Ellen Burstyn, et cetera, that were, you know, who had let it be known that they felt she was an actor's actor. And I know that's how Angela Lansbury felt. I read an interview with her once where she said that my mother was one of the greatest actresses anywhere. And, you know, so she was appreciated, but. And she knew it. And she knew it. Oh, yeah, she knew it. But, Good. but, but fame, that kind of, you know, I mean, she knew she was appreciated by people who she appreciated, by people who, who mattered to her. And that's really all she cared about in terms of that wider kind of, of, you know, fame, which often accompanies notoriety, sometimes, you know, uh, being infamous for something. She, she certainly didn't, you know, envy that. God knows there were enough people who had to deal with that in their careers. And thankfully, you know, that was no part of her career. There was a book published in 1989 by Doug McClellan called Eleanor Parker, Woman of a Thousand Faces. I, I was involved in it. I, I helped Doug uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of research and uncovered materials for him and would send him packets of things. And basically, I acted as a kind of intermediary uh, between him and my mom and was, was very helpful to him. In fact, the book is dedicated to me. So, so your mother approved of the book? She, she liked it very much. Yeah. My only complaint with the book is that it's, it's, it's only half really a book about her. The other half of the book is really a, uh, a bibliography. And uh, that part of it's, you know, pretty dry for obvious reasons. You don't, you can't write entertaining bibliographies. Your mom lived to the ripe old age of 91 and passed away on December the 9th, 2013. Do you think she was happy with the life and the career that she had, Paul? Yeah, uh, yeah, very much so. She, in fact, uh, told me some time before she passed away that she said she knew I would feel obviously, you know, deeply devastated when, you know, to lose her. And we were we were best friends, uh, my mom and me. We were really were best friends. And even though she knew it would be very difficult emotionally for me, she said, don't feel that it's it was a tragedy for me because... I'm, I'm not depressed. I'm not going to do anything to myself, anything like that. I'm fine. But, you know, I've had a long, you know, fulfilling life artistically and emotionally uh, at home. And really, I, I don't, I'm just, you know, you get to a certain age, everything becomes more difficult to do physically. And, uh, you know, I'm at the point where I'm just a little tired. And, you know, when it's my time, I'll be, you know, okay with going. Uh, it won't be something I'll be struggling against. I'll welcome it when it's my time. I'm not going to you know, rush it. You're giving me goosebumps because that's exactly what my mother said to me before she died. She said, don't, I don't want you to grieve because I've had a great life and I'm ready. Yeah. Now, Paul, no interview with you would be complete without mentioning a few of your career highlights to date. I mentioned some of your film credits in my introduction, and I understand you played Edgar Allan Poe in a one-man play called Once Upon a Midnight. That must have been an amazing experience. Oh, it sure was. It was a, a real passion project for me. In the course of researching the life of Poe and his works and so on. I actually wound up becoming a legitimate uh, Poe scholar. I've even appeared in a few documentaries about Poe, including the A&E biography episode, The Mystery of Edgar Allan Poe. I'm, I'm all through that as one of the talking heads that can be seen on YouTube. And I also became a, a, a Poe collector. I have a quite an amazing uh, collection. I started collecting uh, Poe when I was probably 19 or 20 years old, and it's continued to this day. And I have hundreds and hundreds of volumes, some of them rare, and you know, it's uh, it's quite a an amazing uh, research library. And I have first printings of his works and some first editions and so on. But I was very compelled because of the parallels between Poe's life and mine. Most people don't realize that uh, Poe's mother was a celebrated actress of her time. And sadly, in his case, his mother died when he was very young. 
and then he was taken in by a wealthy family in Richmond, Virginia, and was became a foster child. And his foster father was not a sweetheart and uh, was a real problem for Poe emotionally. And uh, he was quite scarred by, by those experiences. And Poe only lived to be 40 years old. He looked 60 because of health problems and, and so forth. You look at the famous pictures of him looking very woebegone and so on, which most of the pictures <laughs> did appear to be. But he was, yeah, he was only 40 years old. And he only had that mustache in the last five years of his life. But I was just very drawn, uh, not only to his work, the beauty of his work, not to the horror, but the, 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 the poetry, the, the power of his thought, his philosophy. He had an amazing mind, far-ranging. He was so ahead of his time. He created the detective story. He was a pioneer of science fiction, fantasy, horror, of course, you know, et cetera. Humor, a lot of humor, political humor, social stuff. Amazing. His uh, wide-ranging intellect was truly uh, astounding. So I wanted to bring that to audiences in my play. I co-wrote it with Ron McGid, and he and I uh, together created this play, which we put on originally ourselves in a production that ran for four months in Hollywood, starring myself. And then I did it other places and finally did a, a TV version of it for uh, cable. But then I was so busy doing other things that I kind of put it on the back burner for a little while. And then one time I ran into John Aston, who I knew very well, because I, as I mentioned earlier, I'd gone to school with his kids and I was asking him, you know, what he was up to. And he talked about kind of fiddling around in his head with the idea of eventually creating a one-person play, a, a one-man show. And he said he had had in mind several different literary figures. And I stopped him right then and there. And I said, well, I might just have exactly what you're looking for. And I told him about you know, what had happened with uh, my play. And Ron and I got him the script. And he read it, loved it optioned it from us, brought us in with him to work closely with him on it, which we did in Des Moines, Iowa, in an earlier sort of tryout production. And then it had its opening at the Oslo Conservatory Theater in Sarasota, Florida. And it was such a hit that they, they doubled the run of the show. The reviews were love letters to, and that was the uh, you know, springboard. And then he did it for the next 10 years. He did it in Australia, Scotland, Ireland, all over the U.S., and, you know, there you go. Do you think you'll ever do it again? I'd love to. Yeah, I've thought of it more and more. I've got to tell a couple amusing anecdotes about my mom. It, it wouldn't be fair to her not to show how unique her humor was. <laughs> and for one thing, I mean, this is, this is not an anecdote, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something people wouldn't think would have been the case. Uh, believe it or not, my mom was a huge Lady Gaga fan. Really? loved her. She collected any magazine that had like uh, cover stories on her and articles that she yeah, loved Lady Gaga. And ironically, and sadly, she did not live to see, because it was a year after my mother died, Lady Gaga did that uh, tribute to The Sound of Music on the Oscars. Uh, yes. At the end of which uh, Julie Andrews came out and gave her a tearful big hug and, you know, so forth. Yeah, my mom would have been very pleased by that, needless to say. But uh, yeah, love Lady Gaga. <laughs> there's there's a, an anecdote about my mother that really kind of says it all. Uh, when I mentioned she was not into the adulation, really, and the fame. And the, I got a phone call. People would often call me because they couldn't get to my mother. My mother was so private, her number wasn't readily available to people. So they would find a way to get in touch with me and I would act as the, you know, I would intercede. And uh, I got a phone call from this group that wanted to do a uh, big tribute to her in Italy, an Eleanor Parker festival, at the end of which she'd be presented with an award and this whole thing. And it was going to be a, you know, a big deal, a week long thing. And they would, you know, wanted to fly her out there and put her up and do the, you know, treat her like a queen, the whole thing, right? So, wow, I thought that's pretty impressive. That sounds pretty cool. So, you know, I call up my mom and I tell her about this. Hey, mom, this is, this is what I just got. I got, just got this call. This is what they said. And I tell her the whole thing I just told you. And there was a brief silence on the phone. And then in a very cheery tone of voice, she said, Sounds absolutely dreadful. Tell them I died. Oh. <laughs> so what did you do? I told them that she wasn't well enough, that she'd had <laughs> some 
some intermittent health issues and really was not up to, you know, traveling. Yeah. Yes, I see, <laughs> if it were me, I would have gone in her place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did once go in her place to the Academy uh, of Motion Pictures, they had an amazing screening of The Sound of Music as part of their 70 millimeter film festival. And they, they had new prints struck from you know, a handful of major you know, classic films that had been shot on 70 millimeter or, or were on 70 millimeter. And they did this amazing, you know, created this amazing print and had this big event a couple of the kids from The Sound of Music was, were there, uh, Kim uh, Karath, the youngest daughter, and the oldest daughter, who sadly passed away, recently played Liesel, Charmian Carr was there. So they were both there. I had dinner with them before the show, but I was there in place of my mom. And then when the thing before the event began, they had me come up to the podium and read to the audience uh, a letter from my mother thanking them and uh, reminiscing a little bit about the film. It, and she said in the letter that, you know, she had no idea when she was shooting the film, as none of them did, that it was going to become a beloved classic. So, well, you know. Paul, I think it's been a wonderful thing that you have honored her legacy and her memory the way you have. It's been an absolute pleasure to celebrate your mom's life and career with you. She was such a versatile and gifted actress, and I hope you take pride and comfort in knowing that she will continue to live on forever through her wonderful movies and TV performances. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you, Harvey. And yes, believe me, I, I do take comfort in that. And I, I hear from all kinds of people from all walks of life who's, you know, to whom my mother's uh, work has meant a great deal uh, artistically and, and personally. So yeah, I, of course, I do take great pride in, in, in her work and her legacy. Thank you again so much for being here, Paul. Thank you, Harvey. Our guest has been the son of the legendary star, Eleanor Parker. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.